And it's an interesting research project, but it's also a very practical way to look at the equity of management decisions, spatial planning decisions. For example, the uh, researcher has identified these various little polygons on the map as being important to particular communities on shore. So that when a proposal comes along to close a particular area for fishing, or to establish a marine protected area, or to do something, install a wind farm, in a particular place, you can see which communities are actually affected by that decision in terms of coastal, coastal people that depend on those areas for, uh, for income. So without an integrated framework, we have problems in terms of identifying what kinds of conflicts exist. We have, there's a lack of connection between the authorities responsible for these activities uh, in terms of lack of connection uh, to this kind of reality. There's a lack of connection between offshore activities and onshore communities. That was the point of the previous slide. And there's a lack of conservation of biological and ecologically important areas, again, without this kind of uh, integrated spatial approach. Now, I said that we were asked to uh, develop a guide to marine spatial planning. I just want to spend a couple of slides looking at uh, what that guide is. This was a uh, quote that I think uh, sort of exemplifies the problem that uh, we thought we were facing in terms of uh, these are all great ideas, but nobody knows how to do it. So how can you construct something of uh, a practical nature that is a guide to, uh, to planning? You got that, right? Everybody got the joke? <laughs> Uh, again, I said that this is not an, an idea that is unique to Canada or to uh, British Columbia or Pensima. There are a lot of very practical applications of spatial planning, and this is just a short list. There are about 10 others that we considered. When we wrote this guide, we didn't um, sit in an office and sort of say, this is how you should do it. We actually went out and looked at all of these places, sat down with people who were actually doing marine planning. It was a nice job. We went, got to go to Australia, and China, and a few other places. But we also spent a lot of time in Europe look, trying to identify what good practice was. And we took all of that, took bits and pieces. Nobody had a good model that was going to be applicable everywhere. But we took the bits and pieces and put it together in our guide. That's the cover of the guide. Some of you may have seen it. I hope at least some of you have seen this. It's on the same website that uh, I'm going to show you in the end. It was done last August, and it's been a relatively big seller. We've distributed already about 3,000 copies and uh, demand continues to grow because interest in spatial planning is growing. And these are the 10 steps of our planning process. Again, not unique to marine spatial planning only. Pretty standard list of things that you would do in any natural resource uh, problem. By the way, people that are scribbling madly, I'm happy to send this presentation to you if you uh, don't want to take notes. But all that complexity and all that long list of uh, activities boils down really to three simple questions. Where are we today? What's the characteristics and the, the baseline that we're going to use for planning? Where do we want to be? And that gets into the future orientation of what planning is all about. What's the vision of, of what these places should look like in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years? That's the, the challenge of planning is to come up with those ideas. Those scenarios are usually based on, a, again, a structured process that identifies goals and objectives, and you look at different ways to achieve those goals and objectives through different kinds of management measures, including spatial measures. And of course, how do we get there? That's the, the identification of those measures and the development of a plan. So that's, that's, very, that's, that's a very simple list of questions that uh, uh, really get to the point of, uh, of how to do management. We always spend a lot of time identifying principles and goals. We don't spend a lot of time identifying objectives that are measurable, quantifiable, time-bound, all those kinds of things. So as a result, planning often fails because it's too general. If we simply say we want to clean up the water or maintain biodiversity or increase economic opportunity, that's not enough. Plans have to get into a little bit more detail to sort of specify what the real objectives are by what particular time. and. Most importantly, how are you going to achieve those objectives, which are management measures? Uh, the point on, point on this slide really is that there's a hierarchy, there's a relationship between all these things. And a lot of planners just sort of are happy to do principles and then put those aside and then do goals and put those aside and do objectives. So it's really a hierarchy and a, a strong relationship that exists among all of those components of a plan. 
Now, I'm going to wrap this up with just a few examples of international experience and where we think uh, good practice actually exists. One of the key questions of spatial planning is authority. If you don't have authority, planning is a waste of time. And now authority can be defined very different ways. It doesn't all have to be legislated authority. But you better have something to stand on when you actually prepare a plan, either an agreement or a, you know, a mandate from a political person or something that says that planners just can't start plans and expect them to be paid attention to. A good example of this occurred in Australia. Apologies to those of you who may have already heard this example, but uh, Australia has, has done a uh, excellent job of identifying large bioregions, they're like the lomas of Canada, the large ocean management areas of Canada, except they're wall to wall, they go all the way around Australia. One of them is in the southeastern part of Australia, and about six or seven years ago when Aust Australia got interested in doing ocean planning, they established an ocean program office, staffed it, got to work on a marine plan for the southeast region, developed a very technically sound marine plan, looks great, it has a nice read and a nice story to it, they published the plan and said, okay, now we're going to implement this plan. And a couple of other national or federal agencies said, and who gave you the authority to prepare this plan? And you expect us to, to pay any attention to it? So it's a good example of having the authority, having the buy-in of agencies that might provide the authority to the planning process. Without that, you're sort of dead in the water. That, that plan, by the way, again, is, looks very nice. It's been taken off the Department of Environment's website in Australia. It doesn't exist. It's a non-plan. And uh, you can find it on the website that I mentioned, but you won't find it anywhere else. Participation. Uh, well, I didn't say anything about the UK. The UK is a uh, good example of a place that said, we don't have the authority to do marine spatial planning. We're going to create that. So they actually spent five years writing and pushing through Parliament new legislation to conduct not only marine spatial planning, but make other marine management operations efficient, including fisheries and protected area management. But marine spatial planning was an important part of that, and, and it took them five years to get that legislation. So there is a price to pay for establishing authority occasionally. That's the Australian example. Those colors aren't so hot, but this is the southeast over here. And that's the plan that basically went nowhere. Let's get past this. Massachusetts. That's an interesting one because, uh, again, we often talk about participation, that stakeholders should be involved in, uh, in the planning process. Uh, it varies from place to place. It's dependent on the decision-making culture and the, the nature of politics in, in many places. But again, in uh, North America and, and the U.S. Uh, in particular in this case, participation is, is very much a requirement of the planning process. And Massachusetts did a very thorough job of preparing a plan that used public input and stakeholder input as part of the planning process. There's one other additional feature of this plan is that it was produced in one year. So it's a good example of the time that is sometimes required for marine planning. It does not have to be 10 years. It doesn't have to even be five years. It can be a relatively short period of time. Again, as, as long as you see planning as a continuous process. And that's the way Massachusetts characterized their plan. It was, they had a piece of legislation at the state level that said, you will produce a plan. Actually, it was 18 months, but it also said it's going to take six months to review the plan. So you take away six months, you have one year to do the technical work. Of, of the planning process, and they did it.